Aloha from beautiful Maui. My name is Justin Gordon, and I'm here today to give you my talk for Rails Conference 2021, Implicit to Explicit, Decoding Ruby's Magical Syntax. I've wanted to give this talk for a really long time. Um, one of the reasons why I want to give this talk is that I interview a lot of Rails developers. I'm hiring right now, and one of the problems that I see is that a lot of Rails developers cannot explain to me how the Rails DSL works in terms of basic Ruby code. And once you can understand how the Rails DSL is really just plain Ruby code, then it's really gonna open up your understanding of what you're doing. You're not gonna be copying and pasting code without any understanding. You're gonna be able to look at the code and you're gonna be able to go, hmm, this is exactly what the interp Ruby interpreter is probably thinking. I know where to go get the documentation. I know how to debug it. So when I started Ruby a long, long time ago, I definitely had a lot of these same issues. So that's why I'm so excited to give this talk today. So without further ado, let's get going. So how in the world did I get to Ruby on Rails? For many years before Ruby on Rails, I did Java code. And Java is known as a general purpose language. And what is a general purpose language? Is a language you can do pretty much anything. And that's as opposed to, you're gonna see, we're gonna talk about DSL, domain specific language. So here's a little bit of Java code. It's just really, really basic. And um, this is just a lot of code to just say, hello world, essentially. But every little character in there is necessary. So all the parens, all the braces, et cetera. So that's why I'm gonna you want you to compare. Java is explicit. Now that makes Java a terrible DSL because I don't know if you remember trying to write a, um, how many of you that were around before, maybe even still know what it's like to write a web application in Java. There's just so many files and so much junk. It's just horrible. And that's why Ruby on Rails took off. So with Rails, we got a domain specific language and by a domain specific language, that means that when we got some Ruby code, it is speaking directly to the problem we're trying to solve, which is a web application. So if you take a look at this here, we've got class person extends application record, validates name, comma, presence is true. There's no, not a, hardly a single extra character in this code. This code says exactly what this thing is you want. You want to define this person class and it's going to have validation on the name. So that's what we mean by a DSL. So, but this code also has a lot of things that were implicit in it. And that's what makes it, um, again, a great DSL, but hard to understand. And these are the things I'm going to cover in this talk. Like what exactly is self? What are the variable, you know, what, you know, variable declarations you'll see in Ruby, you don't actually do anything to declare variables, parentheses, etc. So a long time ago, I learned Ruby on Rails from the Rail, Ruby on Rails tutorial. And this is kind of what I thought it was going to be like, you know, I was going to go in there because of all my experience with Java and I'd really understand exactly what, what's going on here. But the reality was, this is what I felt like when I was reading all this Ruby code. I was like looking at this stuff going, what exactly is going on here? You know, is this kind of like the compiled code I was used to because I was saying compilers. And if that was the case, that was like, it's something like this has many, it's something like the compiler expects, you know, what's the difference between Ruby and Ruby on Rails? I actually probably believe like a lot of beginning Ruby on Rails people don't really quite know the difference between Ruby and Ruby on Rails. So I got a confession to make here. So what I did is I just copied and pasted the code. I'm not sure if I actually know how to code or I'm really good at copying and pasting. How many of you felt like that when you're going through the Rails tutorial? I bet a few of you did. I did. And I knew a lot of code, but I didn't really understand the fact that all that DSL code was just some plain code that I could put um, a print statement in there. I can um, put in a binding.pry. I'll show you in a little bit. And we could actually see exactly what's going on with that code. So let's fix this. So can we learn to read the code like the Ruby interpreter? I'm gonna want you to be able to look at this code 
And you're going to be able to do another take there. So I want to see, can we learn to read the code like the Ruby interpreter? So one does not simply copy and paste code. One must understand the code. And by this, I'm going to want you to go look at this code in the future after this talk, and you're going to know, be able to read that code and know it's not some magic Rails DSL, but this is just plain Ruby code. These are messages we're sending to objects. These messages have arguments. There are going to be some variables that are going to be declared. Um, you're going to declare some variables. And that's pretty much a lot of what's going on. So there's just no mysteries. So can we see the Rails DSL some basic building blocks? And that's what I mentioned. You'll see these are the two fundamental basic building blocks, assigning values to variables and sending messages to objects. So now what I want to do is I want to actually do a little compare and contrast of JavaScript and Ruby. So JavaScript is very explicit and Ruby is often very implicit. So let's, and I know JavaScript is very familiar to a lot of you, especially some of the newer Ruby on Rails programmers. So with JavaScript, parentheses always mean function invocation. No parentheses, no function invocation. So it's absolutely, absolutely critical. How many Ruby on Rails programmers have done some JavaScript and forgotten to put those parentheses? You know, I certainly have. So if we look at that window.close there, that's just a value. And the value could be a function in Ruby. So, and with the parens, we're gonna invoke the function. Now the key thing is Ruby, parentheses are optional. So if we look at this has many, has many micro post dependent destroy right there, it looks kind of like, what the heck is this thing? And then as soon as we put these parentheses there with the has many, this looks like a regular method call. Hmm, has many, takes an argument, micro post, and then you'll see that this dependent colon, colon destroy, that's gonna be a hash. Okay. So here's another critical thing. In Ruby, zero arg method calls are indistinguishable from values. So you've got implicit, it would be like user.first. This is in fact the, you know, nobody ever writes the parentheses there. But if you really wanted to be explicit, you could be, you could say user.first with parens, just to make it clear that you're actually invoking the method which as I mentioned, is really sending a message to that object. So let's go back and forth between implicit and explicit. I'm gonna flip back and forth these here and you see this implicit has many on this user model and explicit self dot has many, you got the prens, you got the braces, you can see exactly what's going on here. Beginning Ruby on Rails programmer looks at this and this is just pretty much a magical syntax there. What exactly is that has many, you know, is this, how, how's that working? And it's really just a method on the self. And what is the self there? The self is the user class. Let's take a little break from the slides and let's go take a look and see how we can edit user test.rb and see that the tests still pass. And this is one good way you can see that what I'm telling you here is really the truth. You can really add all this extra stuff to the Rails code. So here's, um, here's my Rails model here. And let's say I kind of want to go edit something here. And if I put in a space right there, we're going to go and take a look at these tests here and we're going to see that they don't pass. So why do you want to see the tests don't pass? You want to make sure you're editing the right file. So let's um, go back there and let's, um, let's put a paren and and let's see if this still passes. Awesome, still passes, looks good. So there you go. And the and we'll I'll go I'll keep going back to these examples of going over some code and switching back and forth from the slides. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, custom operators. Here's another one. I'll do this again. 
All right, let's take a look at custom operators. Here's another one where you'll see, this is some pretty magical code here where we've got this following and we got this operator lesson, lesson, and um, with this other user. And this, what this does here is this will take the relationship of following and we're gonna add the other users. So this is what it looks like if it's explicit here. So this here, you'll see following is just a method and dot, and that's just another method on it, the lesson, lesson. Let's look at this again. So do you think that if um, a lot of beginning um, Rails programmers, I asked them, could you go explain this line in terms of, you know, basically how Ruby code works? Yeah, I'm going to do this one one more time because I like the way I did it the first time where I went through this first before showing the other one. Okay. All right, let's go take a look at a custom operator and let's take a look at how much these implicit parens can really make a difference. So what we got here is a user class and we got a method here, follow. Um, it's gonna take an argument of the user. And let's just say that so far you explain, um, say you're interviewing for a job or whatever, you're trying to explain this in terms of basic Rails code, Ruby code, I mean, and so, how are you gonna explain this next line in terms of sending some messages to some objects? So what we got here is you got this following, but following there, what that is is gonna be, it's gonna be, um, be a method call, and I'll be able to put some parens on there. And then we've got another method call, which is gonna be the lesson lesson, and it's gonna take an argument, the other user. That's kind of hard to see there. But imagine if we just put in the parens. Now you got the following method, you got the dot, whatever the result of that is, you're calling the lesson lesson and you're passing in one argument, other user. Look how much easier that is to see right there. All right, let's now, let's go take a look at some more, some JavaScript code. So no implicit receiver in JavaScript except for window or global. So what does that mean? It basically means that you can in, um, in, well, in JavaScript, you can say confirm high, and it's the same thing as window.confirm high. But there's a big, big difference if you put this dot foobar versus foobar without the this. How many Rails programmers ever forgot to put the this in some JavaScript code? I'm sure a lot of a lot of you have. I definitely have. So this is never implicit. You have to have you have to have this there. Now this is um, it's very different than Ruby because Ruby's got always this implicit receiver of a message itself, and that is um, a really really key part to be able to look at some Ruby code and understanding what's going on because you have to understand what the implicit self is. So the self, you can make this implicit or explicit. So here, so we've got class user has many, and it's got this method call here, but you can write this at explicitly as self dot has many. And once we do that, we can see exactly where is that has many method, you know, what, what, what is it actually acting on? Going from implicit to explicit, is really the main part of this talk. So here in this diagram, I'm clearly showing you that there's some implicit message receiver in front of that has many, and then there are some message arguments, and the message name is has many. So you've got the receiver, the message name, and the message arguments. And that is the nature of having a DSL built on top of Ruby. And when you think about that, You'll be, able to, you'll be able to look at this line of code and then you'll be able to see it explicitly. So here we have the implicit message receiver self, which as I've mentioned, is almost never written out explicitly. It's usually there implicitly. You have the method name, has many, and there we have a dot showing you that we're actually invoking a method. And there inside the parentheses, you have the message arguments. So now it's really crystal clear that implicit and explicit. So how does pry, why is pry in this talk? Well, one of the really useful aspects of pry is it lets you see what self is. So we can put a few binding.prys in the code and we can introspect. 
So let's do this little quick demo with Pry. So I'm going to start the Rails server. I'm going to put in a couple binding.prys. Here I've got my user model class from the Rails tutorial. I'm going to put a binding.pry. Put another binding.pry. What this means is that the code execution will stop at the first line before the second line is executed, and then we'll stop inside of the class definition there. And then I'm going to put another, I already have another binding.pry in one of the methods inside of this user definition. So let's start things up. I'm going to start up the Rails server with web concurrency one, Rails max threads one, because I don't want multiple threads running when I'm going in pry. So let's see what happens. I'm going to click on follow. And this is our Rails tutorial app. So once we get into pry, my prior C that I'm going to, um, all the, bo the bottom of all the slides, it shows a link to where I can give you all the resources from this talk. So here I have a bunch of debugging shortcuts I print out. This is from my prior C. Now, a little later in the talk, I'm going to be going in more detail about private. Right now, I just want to show you the usefulness of seeing self. So here, this is the first breakpoint we've hit, binding.pry. This line here, this little symbols, shows you that we're just about to execute this line. If I put in user here, we haven't actually run that line yet. So what is self in this case? Self in this case is your main, which is your global object. We could actually see the methods on, on main, but with ls. So here's what's right here. Here are a couple little, little um, patches to self from active support. So that is what self is outside of the user class. It's always there, main. So now let's go inside of the user class and see what self is. So I hit C to continue. So now I'm inside the user class. We haven't run this command yet. As I mentioned that self, um, whatever self is, it's actually showing up right here in this pry prompt. I can go self right there. And there we go. It's the application record. So right now we're about to execute has many. If I wanted to, I could even see the source code for has many. And this is why pry is so useful when kind of digging into the Ruby code. I could hit dollar sign, which is my shortcut for show doc, has many. And that shows you the source code from active record. And I could also see the doc for has many. I find that pretty darn useful. I hit back W for where, and it shows you where I am. And anyway, I'm about to execute that line. Well, let's continue past all this and let's see what happens when we get into an instance of the user. So I put in a binding.pry in the follow method and following that's part of, um, that's a relationship. And then there's going to be that, um, method is going to get executed. So right here, self, what is self? Well, self right here, right? Um, the prompt is showing you it's pound user. So self right there, I can also print it out here. And this is the instance of the user. We'll talk a bit more about pry in a couple more minutes. So next with JavaScript, you can have explicit dec You have to have explicit declarations of variables. You have to use var letter const. So in Ruby, it's implicit. And this is a really, really key thing because this is going to affect um, when we take um, how we know what self is. Because here, when we say result equals, it is a variable is being declared because we're saying the syntax and Im implicitly declaring a variable is takes precedence over a method, say, that would be result equals. So if you say result equals, you're making a variable there. So sometimes you have to have the explicit self. And I think a lot, this has really confused a lot of Ruby on Rails programmers. So when you say def email equals value right there, like let's just say we, um, we have some setter method here, email equals. So the name of the method is email equals, ending with the equals. So there we're saying assign the instance variable email to equal a value. Now suppose what if we wanted to do down case email, have another method. Now here we would have email equals email dot downcase. The problem is this doesn't work 
because email equals is not calling the email equal method. It's because what we're doing is we're declaring a new, we're defining a new local variable. So this is the correct way. You have to use self.email. And if we look at this with the parentheses, it becomes very clear what's happening. You're calling the self with email equals and with an argument of email down case. So with the Rails controller, so here's another good example of how many people have seen this code? Um, this is, um, you see this in the Rails tutorial when you're learning Rails. This code is pretty darn mysterious. This is how you, when you look at this code and um, the Rails controller, what we're doing here is we're going to be figuring, we're going to be defining what sort of XML we're going to return if the browser wants XML. We're going to be returning some JSON if the browser wants JSON. So what in the world does this all mean? Well, what we can do again is let's put in the parens and I think you'll see that this is way more explicit and it's way more clear what's happening here. So respond to, there's nothing magical there. It's a method on the controller. And then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be calling it with a block that takes an argument called format. And then we're gonna be calling methods inside of um, format and that method like format.xml, it's gonna take another block and that block's not gonna execute unless the um, unless Ruby wants it, Rails wants to send back some XML. Another thing that's explicit versus implicit is JavaScript, you always have to have an explicit return other than for the fat arrows. In Ruby, you always have an implicit return for the blocks and the methods. Now, you don't really need too much to put in the implicit returns in Ruby to see that. I just wanted to mention that, it's important to know. So how are libraries used in JavaScript for Ruby? This is again, this is really important to know because in JavaScript, everything is always explicitly imported. So you have import React from React. Nothing is ever gonna get magically um, in there. In Ruby, you have to do this constant lookup stuff. So you don't, um, you rarely see stuff. Nothing is ever explicitly put in the Ruby files. It's more of a global sort of lookup and it's based on case. Like lowercase would mean it's a local variable or it's a message sent to some object. All right, so enough theory there with slides about what's explicit, implicit, et cetera. Now I wanna go play around with Pry. I'm gonna show you a few of the techniques, a few of my favorite techniques. I'm gonna show you how you can figure out the right syntax in your, in your Rails code way easier than just about anything. I'm gonna show you get the docs, et cetera. So basically you're gonna be able to play with the code quickly, you're gonna interact, change, experiment, see results and learn. This is definitely cool stuff. All right, let's do this. Let's get right in the demo of Pry. Um, let's get the Rails server started. I've got a special script here, Rails debug. And what that script does is gonna make sure that I'm running only with a single thread for Puma because otherwise it gets very confusing. So let's get the Rails server started up. And I've got a demo already set up here, a couple breakpoints. So I'm gonna hit follow. And then when I hit follow right here, I'm going right into my, um, my um, controller, the relationships controller here. So I've got a really, really cool Pry RC for you all to try out. It gives you all these like cool colors and just it's just this cool setup. I'm working on this for a really long time. Um, you'll see when you set it up, you can just hit um, um, help. And when you hit help, you can see everything there that's kind of set up for you. You can hit um, more help right there. And I've even got some little tips in here. Um, and this is a printout from my prior C that gives you like kind of the key shortcuts here. And I gave myself even a couple little useful notes here like, hey, be careful not to use shortcuts for temporary variables like u equals this because guess what, u means up. And that will confuse the heck out of you. So very, very useful. Let's go back to where we are. It's the w command. So that means where. And then if I wanted to, I could even, um, you know, I could say user right there and I could see it's nil. I can go to the next line and I can go see the users right there. It prints out pretty with all these colors. Awesome. Now let's take a look and let's see if we wanted to, um, now let's go to the next method here and you're gonna like this. 
we just went into the follow one. Do you remember I told you all about um, following and how we made it more explicit? So there we've got the explicit syntax. Now let's suppose we want to find the documentation for that less and less than sign. Do you think, do you think Pry could let us do that? Absolutely. So check this out. So whenever you hit the question mark, that means documentation. And I could hit follow and even hit the um, tab key. And then there and following and prints are optional there. I can do it or not do it. And then I can do that. And then what's going to happen is then I'm going to get the documentation for that. Now, how cool is that? How long would it take you to find the documentation for that by searching around on Google? You know, pretty hard, especially for some of these operators. So I absolutely love that. So that's, um, that's my little quick tip on that one. So let's keep going here. Hit the continue. So next thing over here, I got a second little binding dot pry inside this block. So one thing I didn't mention to you about self, well, first of all is here is that we could call in here. Um, first of all, if I wanted to see like what's in self, you know, what, what is self right here? Self right there is a controller. Now, whenever you're inside of a block, you cannot necessarily assume you're in the control, you're in the parent one, but in this case you are. And that's because this, this method here respond to is probably like running the block in a normal format like yield. And it's not doing something called instant exec because that's, I'm going to show you in a sec with pry how we can actually figure out what's happening in the, um, configuration files for rails. So right here, you've got format.html and this method could run. I could even, if I wanted to see, I could see the source code. So this dollar sign here, it's also a short code for short show doc format. Remember I told you this is not a variable. These are all method calls. So let's see the documentation for that format method call. And there you, um, there you go. This is actually, if I scroll up right here, this is, I did show doc and I can actually do show source. So there's a source code for that. How cool is that? In fact, what I can even do, um, when I'm here in the, the rails code here is I can even go and edit, fi edit files. Like if I said here, edit, um, dash C that's the current position. And guess what? Boom, that takes me right back into Ruby mine. So I can quickly do some editing. So another um, really cool thing though, is what if I wanted to um, edit format? Maybe I want to put in some print statements in there or something. You can even go in there. Um, I think it must be just, it didn't find exactly where, oh, that format is. I'm not sure if that worked exactly. It usually works pretty good, but it's pretty darn cool that you can pretty much go anywhere in the code. So anyway, let's um let's keep let's keep jamming. Okay, so that's the first part of my little demo in Pry. So let's now go. Um, I just showed you the um this part, the show doc parts. So let's now go take a look at the user model and let's go put our binding dot Pry in the Rails DSL setup for the user model. Let's go over to user. I'm going to uncomment out that binding.pry. Now, here's a really important thing to know is that if you change a model in Rails, um, Rails will automatically reload it. But if you actually change one of those files inside of the Ruby on Rails gem, it's not going to reload. You're going to have to restart. So very, very important. So let's go over here and let's go back and let's do anything. And guess what? That's going to reload the user class, really anything. So let's take a look at what is has many. Let's say, I don't remember where the documentation is on that. How cool is that? You can go see the documentation for has many right there. I can even go and see the source code for has many and dollar sign is a shortcut for that. And there's a source code for has many. I can go see what self is here. And self in this case is not an instance. This is the actual class. This is a user class. Big difference. 
So now does this make a whole lot more sense when we we're looking at, we're looking at the doc for has many, or we can look at, it's the same thing. If you did self dot has many. So that way you could actually really play around with this code here, right in pry, and you can kind of see exactly what's going on. So let's continue here and let's see what the next little demo I got planned is. All right. So we've done all of these ones I wanted to show you. Um, belongs to validates. Oh yeah, if you wanted to, we could have uh, actually gone in there and we could have seen the documentation for those. So let's um, keep going in these slides. I already showed you that, how you can get the docs for that. So method missing. All right, this is like a really cool thing I'm gonna show you. This is the last big little demo in price, so stay with me here. And I'm gonna show you, this is the last really big part about magical Ruby, is method missing. It's just, this is what kind of makes it a great DSL. And what is method missing? It means that if you send a message to some object and there's no method for it, guess what? You have a place to actually run some code. Now, this is actually used in the config objects in Rails. So let's take a look at that. So the config object is like this config environments development.rb. I've got my mysterious forest setting here. Okay, let's go and let's look at the code. So here's my development RB here. And I'm going to put in a couple of these binding dot prize here. A little print statements in there that's also useful for seeing what's going on. So let's run this. I'm going to have to go and restart the rail server. Okay, so what do you think self is at this point? And you're not seeing a lot of the code here. So let's type where w20, where 20. So now you're here. I put the binding.pry at the very top level of this file. So what is self? Self is main. So whenever you're outside of any objects, this is a top level object. In fact, I could even see all the possible methods on main. I could do an ls, ls self or just ls. Remember, self is always implicit. So these are the things that, that are on that main object right there. So let's now, let's continue and let's see what happens here. So what the heck is gonna happen? Rails application configure, what's it gonna do? So right now, so we now we are, again, I'm gonna do like 20 so you can see where we are. So right now we're at this line right there and we're at the self config cache classes false. Let me go down a little bit. And what I did is I put a config.typo in right there. So let's see what this is gonna look like. So if I type config, first of all, what, what is config? Config.class. Config.class is your Rails application configuration. If I um, print out the whole config, there's a lot of stuff in there, so it looks really bad. So get back to kind of where I was showing things right here. So. If, We're 15, that's um, better right there. Okay, so let's take about this. What if I type config.typo? Well, there's no method typo or type, okay? They don't exist yet. So watch this. So now I'm gonna go to the next method there. Now remember, um, self.config and config is the same thing. So because the self is implicit. So now I'm gonna step into this. So when we step into this, um, the config is lazily loaded, but that's not important here. Now we're in method missing. So now you see exactly what happens with method, method missing. So what method missing does is it takes a name, which I called typo right there. And guess what? It ends with an equals. So we're going to get to this line right there. And we're going to set the value to args first. So args is one, two, three. And that's what's going to happen. If I just say typo without the equals, that's where we just return the value. So all this is a hash with different config values. Now, if we don't actually match up with something, 
which is, um, you see this options key name. That's why we ended up in the super and we got the meth, um, the message that the method cannot be found. So let's hit step. Boom, right there. We're going to set that value in options and hit there. Okay. Now if I do config dot typo, guess what? It's one, two, three. So now that's, um, yeah. So that's it for, um, that's kind of method missing and that's, you know, a big part of the magic of pry. So let's, um, let's get on to the next slide. All right. So great. You made it. That's it. Um, you survive with me through this whole talk, which I basically, I hope at the, by now you really realize that there's just not a lot of magic in the rail stuff. It's not magic. It's just a lot of stuff. A lot of that syntax just had a lot of implicit parens, implicit self, implicit variable declaration, Im implicit variable assignments. So once you actually are able to read the Ruby code and take that out, I think you can have a much better understanding. And I gave you a couple little tools. So here's the bottom line. When the Ruby code looks a bit magical, try to make it a little more explicit in your head. Maybe explore it with a binding.pry. So I've got references for you here. You got all these tips, my prior C, you got the little kind of little changes I made to the rail sample app. I want to thank the open source sponsors for react on rails, rails, Autoscale, scout browser stack, honey badger and Ruby mine. They've been supporting a lot of these companies have been supporting react on rails for years. Uh, a lot of you probably know about me from react on rails. So um, check it out, shock code, highchi.com, we're hiring. So come, um, just go to the career link there. Um, check out highchi.com, vacation rental price comparison. There's nothing like it. This is our own little startup app. So that's it. I hope you had a good time. Have fun with the code. Happy Ruby programming. And don't ever get stuck again. Aloha.